Hi, this is Eleanor Fox. I am happy to be with you today virtually. I am sorry I could not be there in person. Um, I want to thank Katz and Pradeep Mehta in particular um, for organizing what looks to be a really important conference. I will be talking today about competition policy and inclusive growth in developing countries. And here is my outline. I will say a word about my thesis, a word about what is the problem that competition policy might help to solve. Then we will talk about how competition law may help and then how competition policy may help. Here is my thesis. Developing countries need growth. The growth thus far has been rather lopsided growth meaning that huge portions of the society are still left out of major market opportunities and the gains of trade go disproportionately to those who are already better endowed and better enabled. There is a two-tiered system that is forming with large multinationals occupying a lion's share of many markets, leaving indigenous populations largely to the informal economy. So I call this a two-tiered system, and it is not a good system that for inclusive growth, there must be one tier. And it must be the case that the great left out majority in many of the developing countries have a fair shot at being a part of the market. So is competition law relevant? And my answer is yes, competition law is very relevant as one means to try to achieve more equity and efficiency in bringing the huge portions of the left out populations into the market. Uh, so we are going to talk about this. And basically, my thesis is that competition law, especially for developing countries, and especially where there has been a great left out majority, meaning a lot of inequality, has to have regard for easing the outsider's pathways to markets. Uh, so there has to be lower barriers, concentration on lower barriers, and concentration on more equality of opportunity in contesting markets. But what is the problem? doesn't competition law already cure market failures? The problem is that in a large part of the world, antitrust law is actually pretty conservative. So here is a view from the West, especially my country. Markets work. Be careful not to chill dominant firms' incentives to innovate. Be very careful about finding exclusionary restraints because you are probably going to be protecting inefficient competitors. That might be so in the United States, although I sometimes doubt it, but it is not so in developing countries where the problem is that masses of people have been deprived of a real opportunity to enter the market so that is the problem, that without taking seriously the values of open markets, access to markets, opportunity of outsiders to compete on the merits, you have a two-speed market system where dominant firms, and they're mostly foreign firms, in one sense, own the market. Now I want to say a few words about how competition law can help the process of a more equitable involvement of outsiders in the market. And I'm limiting this to competition law objectives. I'm not including other social objectives. I'm making the argument then that actually you get a better market result if the law leans towards inclusion. So here are five points on how the law can help. Exclusionary practices 
when you're trying to figure out whether conduct is anti-competitive, suppose it's loyalty rebates, for example, take seriously the exclusions and marginalizations of outsiders, as well as take seriously whether the firm using the conduct is providing something helpful to consumers. Number two, which is really a subset, especially when there are exclusionary practices of state-owned enterprises, be very concerned that outsiders are excluded from the fair chance to enter and expand. Number three, on exploitative practices, one of the kinds of harmful conduct which we see often in developing countries is excessive pricing that actually harms markets in a very significant way. Um, there were a couple of cases in South Africa uh, where excessive pricing, that's my word, excessive pricing, not found by the court in the end, but very high pricing of an input from a recently privatized firm with no competition in say steel can actually hurt the whole industry of users of steel and make them non-competitive. One must develop simpler rules for excessive pricing violations. Excessive pricing violations also often are in the area of pharmaceuticals where people cannot get medicines they need. And an easier way to determine those cases is very much in order. Number four, market studies that give either the agency or the tribunal the possibility of ordering structural relief that will make the market work and ease entry. Many statutes um, give agencies the power to do market studies, but not much power to remedy, them, remedy the problems that are found in the course of the market studies. Some do, like the UK. Many more laws ought to be allowing for a remedy with teeth. And number five, remedy with teeth in general. Um, jurisdictions have to be more creative in thinking of practical relief that will ease entry of outsiders into the market. I know South Africa has done this in a couple of instances, including um, a cartel case, remedies in a cartel case, which include, among other things, funding and seeding the way, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, for small enterprises and especially of historically discriminated against persons to enter and engage in the market. Competition policy is all policy that involves competition, and I'm using it here to mean policy other than competition law. Competition policy can do a lot. In developing countries, the policy that is other than the law enforcement can be much more important than the law enforcement because the countries might look around them, the agencies might look around them and find that the work that has to be done to open markets involves advocacy, involves working with the legislature and other methodologies that are other than law enforcement, even to create a space so that competition can work. So here are just a few. Um, the authorities, have to have their minds set on where are the restraints to entry by outsiders, where they might pick a fight and they might win. This is a sensitive subject because there are many fights that they cannot win because of the political arrangements. So number two, but it's really part of number one, destroy privilege and incumbency advantages where you can. Um, number three, just look around and see what is needed. Why so many people in the society are unable to pierce the market veils. 
the entrepreneurs need credit. If they're unconnected, they often cannot get credit. They might have no collateral to put up, which affects many women who own farms and run farms. So think and look around for the best way to make the credit market work better. Or if the market can't work to jumpstart it in some way, which might be funding um, as market friendly as possible. Number four, I put down education and retraining only because education and deficiencies in education are a huge part of the problem. It's a different problem from competition itself, but must be addressed. So number five, much more centrally to competition itself, research. And a secret at the University of Johannesburg is doing this research, and it's research on the cost of unnecessary barriers to entry and opportunity. They're doing wonderful research on very particular markets, very roots up research showing how and where there are unnecessary market barriers that may not be noticed and might come down. So number six is brainstorming, um, thinking and inspiring from whatever angle. Um, there is an interesting competition each year put on by ICN and the World Bank Group, which is a competition advocacy contest asking anyone who wants to, any agency that wants to participate, um, what is the most, the best success story you have this year of how you have used advocacy to increase competition. And usually this, the stories are from developing countries and they're very inspiring stories about how they have set their sights on barriers that keep the left out majority from having the fair chance to compete. Many of them incidentally relate to procurement, that there are so many countries in which there seems to be a conspiracy in which there are the big firms um, have some kind of bid rig and the government official plays into their hand and may get bribed and may set the specifications only that could be met only by one of the bigger companies for artificial reasons. They set the specifications to play into the hand of what the big companies provide. Uh, so a number of the developing countries have found the restraints and done something and sometimes successfully um, to go after these restraints and open the markets to fair competition on the merits. So I put, I put South Africa here under brainstorming for the following reason. As you all know, um, South Africa has proposed draft amendments uh, that, that would amend the competition law uh, for inclusive development, especially of the historically disadvantaged people. And the occasion of the proposed amendments is actually a brainstorming opportunity to think about methods of amending competition law that would be more sympathetic to easing the way of outsiders into markets. So in conclusion, developing countries need inclusive growth and they also need good, strong competition policy that works for the people. To have good, strong competition policy that works for the people and to have inclusive growth, they need openness of markets and concern for the opportunity and access of outsiders to contest the markets on the merits. What happens without inclusive policy you get two tiered markets. I think there is an ennui in the world that disregards the threat of two tiered markets. Inclusiveness is worth the fight. Thank you.